can be seated. If our children want to go ahead and be dismissed, they can go ahead and do that now. If you want to go ahead and take your Bibles and open them up to the book of James, James chapter 1. James chapter 1. Today we're going to look at verses 16 through 18. Um, But when you get there, uh, we're going to start in verse 13 and and read down. uh, And and then we'll, we'll focus today on verses 16 through 18. James chapter 1. Starting in in verse 13 and reading down, this is what we preached on last week, but really this week is a part two or a continuation of what we looked at last week. James chapter 1, verse number 13, it says, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin when it is finished bringeth forth death. Do not err, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth." that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Let's pray and we'll get started this morning. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you. Lord, I thank you for the chance to open up your word. Lord, that we live in a country where we can freely preach your truth. Lord, the truth of this word. Uh, Lord, I, I do pray uh, that, that your word would be preached this morning, that it would not be uh, my uh, uh, Thoughts, Lord, that it wouldn't be my stories, Lord, that it wouldn't be uh, anything to do with me, but Lord, that it would be all about you. Lord, I I pray that you would be what's on display this morning. Lord, I pray that you would fill me with your spirit, Lord, that I would speak the words that you want spoken. Lord, that you would do a work in this congregation this morning. Lord, as you reveal truth about yourself, Lord, that we would grasp it. Lord, that we would internalize it. Lord, that it would change our perspective of you. And as a result, Lord, change how we live our lives in this world. For, Lord, how we view you impacts how we live every moment of our lives. Lord, I pray that we would uh, approach your word this morning with clear minds. Uh, Lord, with clean hearts. Uh, Lord, that so you could work uh, in, in soil that is ready for you. Lord, I pray that you would be with me. Lord, that you would give me the words to say. Lord, that you would open the hearts of those that are sitting in this congregation. Lord, perhaps there are those in here, Lord, that have been turned off to you. Lord, whose hearts have grown hard and cold and far away from you. Lord, who come to church merely as a formality uh, and not because they need it, Lord, not because it is a desire of theirs. Lord, I pray that if that is someone here, Lord, that you would soften their heart this morning. Lord, that they would see that uh, you are not far off, Lord, that you are not hard towards us, uh, but that you love us. Lord, that you have thoughts of good toward us. Lord, that you love us enough to send your son to die for us and for them. Lord, I pray that you would be honored and glorified. Lord, I thank you for so great a salvation that you have given to us. And all this we pray in the name of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, We're going to read verses 16 through 18 uh, as we go through our service. Um, But as I said, we backed up to verse 13 this morning because today is really a continuation. Uh, James is really completing the thought or uh, continuing the thought that we started on last week. Uh, Last week, we we looked at verse 13 and we have spent a lot of time up to this point uh, speaking about temptation. Speaking about trial, uh, and sometimes uh, we, we realize that there's a different type of temptation, uh, not one that is sent from the Lord to develop uh, his fruit and his characteristics within us, uh, but one that seeks to draw us away from God. Uh, a temptation towards sin, a temptation towards evil, to do that which is wrong. And we spoke about how sometimes when we are faced with those situations or when we stumble and fall, our desire is to blame somebody else, 
to point the finger at others around us or most unfortunately to point the finger at God and to blame God for our wrongdoings. And we looked at last week how really that's not the case, how we cannot blame God for our wrongdoings. God himself uh, in his divine nature cannot even be tempted to do wrong. And as a result, he never tempts us to, com uh, to complete uh, or to commit sin. We talk about sin's life cycle within us, how we're drawn away, how our eyes are pulled off of God, and how that brings us to a place where we do sin, and how sin always inevitably ends in death. And so James, uh, continuing this thought in verse 16, begins to set the tone uh, for everything that we're going to look at this morning. That's really what verse 16 is doing. It is setting the tone. He says, do not err, my beloved brethren. Uh, he uses the word err, and he encourages us not to do it. Uh, to err is to be led astray, to be deceived, uh, to get something wrong. James is saying, hey, let me get your attention. Don't get this wrong. Don't be deceived. Uh, don't be led astray when it comes to this. James is affirming the truth and encouraging the acceptance of the fact that God does not make us choose evil, right? That's what we really dug into last week, that God does not make us do evil. Uh, and because there's this natural temptation in us to think that God is the one that's caused us to do wrong, he doubles down on the fact. And he says, don't get this wrong. Do not be led astray. Do not be deceived either by your own self or by those around you. God is not the author of sin, why is he doubling down so much on this? Why is he drawing attention to it after he just did so in previous verses? Well, that's because our understanding of God is what sets us apart as Christians. On Sunday nights, we've been taking time to explore doctrine uh, and to look at what defines us and shapes us as Christians, as followers of Christ, as people that are subjected to this book. Uh, and two weeks ago, we looked at the fact that if somebody believes something different, that that should be an issue for us, that there should be a separating or a division because they believe something separate about what God's word says. You see, our understanding of God is what sets us apart as Christians. If somebody teaches that God is the author of sin and that God forces us to do wrong, we know according to Scripture that that's false. And as such, there should be some distance between us and that body because there's a disagreement about what God's Word says. Uh, take your Bibles and, and open them to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Second Corinthians chapter 11, uh, look at verses 3 and 4. Uh, Paul warns about this very concept uh, that really James is driving at. Do not err. Do not get this wrong. Do not mess up. Do not accept what we know to be false about God the Father or about God in general, right? In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse number 3, Paul writes, he says, but I fear He's worried about these people. He says, but I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. What is Paul saying? He's saying, I fear, I worry for you that just as the serpent led Eve astray, just as Eve, to use the word that James does, erred in her logic, erred in her reasoning, just as she was beguiled, deceived, led astray, that you too would be deceived in your understanding of Christ and his simplicity. He goes on in verse 4 to say, For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit, which ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. Just this morning, uh, Brother Joe was, was asking for prayer for protection from false teachers, people that seek to deceive people and to lead them astray, that preach, as this verse says, a different Christ or a different Holy Spirit, a different gospel. To preach a different Christ or to preach a different Holy Spirit is to preach a different God. Because as we saw last week on Sunday night, Christ himself is God. 
The Bible tells us in 1 John that the Father, the Word, and the Spirit are three in one. And so if someone preaches a different spirit or preaches a different Christ, they are preaching a different God. We are called not to keep fellowship with those people, but to separate because our understanding of God is what sets us apart as Christians. This is why James drills down on this point. He says, do not err, my brethren. Speaking to people like you and me, not a lost world, but Christians, save people that might be easily led astray by false teachers. God is not the author of sin. James sets the tone for that here in this verse. In fact, he is rather the opposite. And that's really what we're going to see in verses 17 and 18 if we turn back to our text. James chapter 1, verse 16, he says, Do not get this wrong. Do not err, my beloved brethren. God is not the author of evil. Rather, he's quite the opposite. If we read in verse 17, it says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. And cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Uh, in verse 17, uh, James begins to show us who God truly is. While we might be tempted to assume or think that God is the author of evil, he says, don't think that. Don't, don't get that wrong. Don't get messed up in that area. In fact, to help you out, I'm going to show you what God is truly like. I'm going to show you who the Lord is truly like when it comes to you and when it comes to me. We see who God truly is in verse 17. We see what comes from him, what it is that he gives us. It is not temptation towards evil that he gives us. No, verse 17 tells us that every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights. It says when it comes down to what God gives us, he speaks about two things, every good gift and every perfect gift. Now, it's under, important for us to, to understand the difference between those two things. Uh, because when we read them in our English Bibles, it uses the word gift twice. Uh, but the truth is, in the Greek, this is two separate words. A good gift is something that's completely different, well, maybe not completely, but is definitely different from a perfect gift. You see, a good gift is a good act of giving. Uh, if I were to speak about uh, tithing and offering, uh, and, and I were to, to have a conversation with someone, you know, Paul talks about this actually, I believe it's in the book of Philippians, uh, he speaks about the church's giving, uh, the, the giving that they've been doing. He's speaking about their action of giving. That's what this good gift is. It is a good act of giving. The perfect gift, on the other hand, uh, is a complete gift. Uh, it is an, an object which is uh, to be possessed, something that is uh, finished in its entirety. It is complete. It is perfect. It is a perfect gift. And so we have a good gift and a perfect gift, a good act of giving and a complete gift. And you, you say, why is this important? Well, it's because there's a lot of different perspectives uh, on what this verse means. Uh, I spent a lot of time uh, this week studying and, and, and trying to see what it is that the Lord is uh, seeking to show us out of these verses. And really, it comes down to two different views. Uh, and the views are not necessarily opposed with one another. Uh, and so we'll look at both of them. The first view is that these are two parts of one process. And I'll explain what I mean. It says, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. Every act of giving and every completed gift is from above. This is what verse one or view one says, that it is two parts of one process. That God has already begun to bless us. That God has already poured out blessing in your life. The act of giving. And not just that, but he will bring those things, bring those blessings, bring those gifts, those actions to completion, the perfect gift, the completed gift. God has begun to give us things in our life, to give us gifts, to give us blessings, the giving of the gift, and at some point, he will complete those. He will give them to us in their entirety. Two parts of one continuous process. This is view number one. We can really see this view take place a number of places in the scripture. Uh, take your Bibles and open up to Philippians. Philippians chapter one. Philippians 1, verses 6 and 7. 
Paul writing to the church at Philippi in Philippians chapter 1, verse number 6, he says, Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. He goes on in verse 7 to say, Even as it is meet or even as it is appropriate for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch both in my bonds and in defense and confirmation of the gospel, ye are all partakers of my grace. What is Paul saying? He says, I have confidence of the work that God has started in you, the good gifts that God has begun to plant in your life and cultivate and grow so that you might be a good witness of Jesus Christ. He says, I have confidence. I am assured of the very thing which God has done, which is a good work which he has put in us that he will perform it or he will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. We see this other places. Take your Bibles and open up to the book of Romans. Romans chapter 8. You were in this verse a couple of weeks ago on a Wednesday night. Romans chapter 8, starting in verse 28. Romans chapter 8, starting in verse 28, it says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate, to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And then in verse 30, we get a, a, a listing, a series of the gifts that God has given us, the blessings that God has poured out and bestowed upon us in our life. Some of them having already taken place and some of them yet to come. In verse 30, it says, Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. If you're a Christian, these are all gifts that have already taken place in your life. God has foreknown you. God has predestined you. God has called you to salvation. God has justified you. He has declared you righteous. Someone who at one point was a sinner and was an enemy of God, when you accept Jesus as your Savior, the Bible says that you are justified, that your sinful record is covered by the blood of Jesus, and you are now declared righteous righteous. That is a good gift that God has given you. But the verse goes on. It says, moreover, whom he justified, them he also glorified. You see, our salvation process is just that. It is a process. There is a foreknowledge of God. There is a predestining of your heart in God's eyes. There is a calling of your soul to him. There is a justifying of your spirit. There is a sanctification that goes on right now where we are conformed more and more to the image of Christ. But one day there will be a glorification where we will no longer have any part of us that is sinful, but we will be uh, perfect and whole, entire in spirit and soul and body, glorified with Christ forever. That is a coming gift. It is all a process of salvation where God has given and is giving and will give things to us. Good gifts, acts of giving started, and perfect gifts. Gifts that have been completed and are perfected. This is view number one. Two parts of one process. The second view is a little bit different. It looks at every good gift and every perfect gift as two separate things. A gift and the way that it is given. It says God is not only the provider of good things, of blessings in our lives, perfect gifts, completed blessings. Not only is he the provider of good gifts, but he is also good in the way that he gives them. So this view is, is, is a little bit different. God not only gives us good things, but he's so good that he's also good in the way that he gives them to us. Uh, and we'll look at that here in, in, in just a second. Uh, like I said, the first part of this view is that God gives unto us good things. Uh, turning your Bible, if you would, to Matthew chapter 7 see some of the things that God has bestowed upon us as his sons and daughters. Matthew chapter 7, verse number 11. Jesus says, speaking at, at the end of a series of a question, 
Someone asked him about asking and receiving. Uh, and in verse number 11, it says, If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask him? Right here, very clearly, Christ explains that the Father does indeed give us good things. In fact, really, he draws an allusion to just what we looked at last week. We talked about the fact that man is evil, and he says here, man is evil and he can give good gifts. And then contrasting us against, or contrasting the Father against man, really stating that God is all good. He says, if you being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father implying the fact that he is not evil, but that rather he is all good, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask him? Christ says we do receive good from the hand of the Father. Uh, turn to Second Peter. We see what some of these things are. Second Peter chapter 1, verse number 3. Second Peter chapter 1, verse number 3. What is it that we've received from the Father? What good gifts has he given us that this view claims to be true? In 2 Peter chapter 1, verse number 3, it says, According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. It says we've received all things as Christians that pertain to life and godliness, all things that descend from God, for in God is life and godliness, all things that come from God, it says that we have been made partakers, recipients, heirs of those things, that God has given to you and me all things which pertain unto life and unto himself. It says, uh, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. It says that we've received great and precious promises from God, that God indeed has given us good things. But as this view says, not only has he given us good things, but he is good and how he gives them to us. You see, I can give a good gift in the wrong way. The object itself might be good, might be pleasing, might be nice, might be right, but I can have completely the wrong attitude when I give it. I can give it in frustration, or I can give it sarcastically or nonchalantly, not truly care, or give it with bitterness in my heart towards that person. Give it begrudgingly. Sometimes it's not just a gift, but it's the way that I interact with someone. Maybe I say something really kind to them, but on the inside, I, I feel all sorts of things towards them. Or maybe the words that I'm saying are the right words, but the way in which I say them, the tone that I use to communicate, Communicate them is not the right way. You see, we can give or do or say the right thing, but do it in the wrong way. Do it with the wrong heart, but not so God. You see, God not only gives us good things, but the way in which he gives it to us, the heart which generates within him as he interacts with you and me is always one that is good toward us. Uh, take your, your, your Bibles and, and turn over to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, verse number 8. We don't just see God's gift, but we see the heart that pushes him to give it. Romans chapter 5, verse 8. It says, but God commendeth his what? His love his compassion, his tenderness, his care for your soul. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, 
Christ died for us. In this we see both God's heart and God's gift. He gives us his son, Jesus Christ, to die for us so that we might have a relationship with God. He sends his son so that people who mess up, people who are covered in sin can have those sins washed away. They can find joy and peace and acceptance in the family of Jesus Christ, in the family of God because of what Christ has done. But we also see God's heart. It says that he commends his love towards us. The way and the reason for which he does it is one of love. He is good not only in what he gives, but in how he gives it. These are the two views that accompany these these words that we read about, the good gift and the perfect gift. And the truth is that we find both of them in scripture. And so we don't just have to pick one uh, and, and get rid of the other, but both can be true at the same time. That God is giving things to us, pouring out blessings, and he promises to bring those to completion in your life. But also that though God gives us good things, he also is good in the way he gives them to us. That's what James is saying in verse 17. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. And so we ask ourselves the question, not just what comes from him, every good and perfect gift, but will he always be that way? You see, we we look at ourselves and we see wavering and we see failure. And in turn, we wonder if God is the same way. Well, if, if I don't always give good gifts to my family, if I don't always interact with my family the right way, or if I promise to do something, but I I don't bring it to completion, if I fail in that way and I struggle with my own failure, what if God is that way? What What if God doesn't bring it to completion? What if God maybe does give me something good, but his heart is angry towards me while he does it? We begin to ask ourselves that question, and yet James answers all of those questions with the following phrase. He says, every good gift and every perfect gift Gift cometh from above, from the Father of lights. What an interesting phrase, the Father of lights. Uh, turn, if you would, to 1 John. We'll get a little bit of clarity on this phrase. 1 John chapter 1, verse number 5. Every good gift and every perfect gift from, cometh from above, from the Father of lights. 1 John chapter 1, verse number 5. It says, this then, sorry, I still hear pages turning, I'll wait. 1 John 1, 5, it says, this then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is what? No darkness at all. The father of lights is just that. He is all 100% completely and totally purely light. Meaning that within him there is not a shred or a sliver or an ounce of darkness. Who he is, he is in completion. Who he is, he is in his entirety. He is a God that never wavers, that never changes. And so if it says that God is not the author of sin, but is the author of good in your life, and that he is the reason that you have good things and that those good things are brought to completion, he is the reason that good is experienced in your life, we can rest confident and assured that he He can and never will change from being that. He is all light, and in him is no darkness, no change, no shadow at all is what James says. James 1.17, it says, Every good gift and every perfect gift cometh from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, uh, neither shadow of turning. Uh, That word variableness is a Greek word that describes the teeth of a saw. Set uh, like like a rip saw where one tooth goes this way and the other tooth goes that way and they're set alternating with each other so that it might cut through something. That's the word that James says. It says, in him is no variableness, no alternating, no turning, no changing from the position that he is. He is fixed in his stance and fixed in his characteristics. God never alternates. God never varies. He goes on to say, in him is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Uh, This shadow is just that. It is an eclipsing, a a hiding, a a covering. Uh, James Adamson, a, a, a Presbyterian pastor, he said, 
God's benevolence, his goodness, God's benevolence is like a light that cannot be extinguished, eclipsed, or shadowed out in any way at all. Nothing can block God's light, interrupt his flow of goodness, or put us in shadow so that we are out of reach of his radiance. There is no shadow that blocks you from God's light. There is no variableness. There is no alternating within him. There is nothing that can, uh, uh, on God's end that can pass around him or cover him up that can keep you from experiencing what it is that he has for you. It says that every good gift and every perfect gift cometh down from the Father of lights, in whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. When we fail to experience God's light, it's because of the very reasons we looked at last week. There is no shadow or changing or covering or variableness in God. It is because we are drawn away from him to look at something else by our own lusts and enticed. It says that uh, when our lust has conceived, it brings forth sin. And when our sin uh, comes to the end of its term, it brings forth death. But on God's end... There is nothing about him that turns. There is nothing about him that hides. There is nothing about him that removes his light from you, removes his goodness from you. Every good gift in your life is from God. Every perfect gift in your life is from God. Every good act of giving that you have experienced comes from God. God is not the author of evil. No, he is the author of all blessing and goodness in your life, and nothing can ever change that about his nature. That is who James shows that our God truly is. He says, do not err, my beloved brethren. God is good. And then in verse 18, he begins to show us the proof of his goodness, the greatest and best gift that he has ever shared with us. In verse 16, he says, do not err, my beloved brethren. In verse 17, he says, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. And then in verse 18, he says, of his own will, begat he us with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. We saw who God is, and then we see what he has given us. The greatest Gift, the greatest illustration and display of God's goodness is that He proves His goodness through the work of regeneration, through salvation, through taking people like me and taking people like you that deserve nothing but an eternity separated from God and giving us new life, giving us salvation offering to you and me forgiveness from our sins and from our failures. God proves his goodness through this work of regeneration. Uh, Take your Bible and and, and turn over to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 1. Look what Paul says. Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 1. Paul very clearly states Simply that, and you hath he quickened, and you hath he made alive, regenerated, given new life to. You're not dead in your sins anymore. You don't have to live as a slave to corruption anymore. You don't have to live that old life anymore. It says, and you hath he quickened, made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins. If you question whether or not God is good, you need only look at your own regenerated life. That God has made you alive where you were once his enemy and far from him and dead in your sins. Uh, Turn over to John. John chapter 5, verse number 24. John 5, 24. Jesus says in John 5, verse 24, Verily, verily, or truly, truly, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is past, has journeyed, has been changed, but is passed from death unto life. This is the greatest gift that God has given us. 
It is the gift of salvation that he has enabled us through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ to pass from spiritual death into spiritual life. God proves his goodness through the work of of regeneration. Uh, James chapter uh, 1 verse 18, it says of his own will that he begat us. It says he, he begat us. He gave birth to us spiritually. He gave us new life. Uh, Look at John chapter 1, verse number 12. John chapter 1, verse number 12. It says that God begat us. He gave us life as his sons and daughters. It says in John 1, 12, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God even to them that believe on his name, which were born, begotten, which were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. It says that God begat us, that he gave us life according to his will. That's exactly what James chapter 1, verse 18, it says. It says, of his own will, Begat he us. God was not forced to save you. God was not restricted and confined and chained to the act of saving you. No, it was his will to redeem you. It was his desire to regenerate you, to give you new life. It was his will, his want, his desire to save you to give you new life. He looked before the dawn of time and chose you, predestined you to salvation, called you to himself, justified you, is sanctifying you, one day will glorify you. It is his desire that you would be his. It says, according to his will, begat he us. It goes on to say that, that this gift, that it came by the word of truth, It says, of his own will, begat he us with the word of truth. What is James saying? He's saying you've been saved by Jesus Christ. That Jesus Christ is the reason that you have experienced salvation. The truth is Jesus is the only reason any of us experience salvation. You know, Acts talks about this. Turn here, if you would. Acts chapter 4, verse number 10. Acts chapter 4, verse number 10. Peter and John have been arrested at this point for preaching the gospel, for preaching salvation. And in Acts 4, verse number 10, their response continues. They say in Acts 4, 10, Be it known unto you all, the people on the council, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him does this man stand before you whole. This is the stone which was sat at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby ye must be saved. Understand what Peter uh, and, and, and John are, are saying here. Understand what James is saying in uh, the first chapter and in the 18th verse that salvation comes by Jesus Christ and by Jesus Christ alone. There is nothing that you can do in your life that earns you salvation. Your parents cannot get you saved. Uh, you going to church cannot get you saved. You getting baptized does not give you salvation or entrance into heaven. It is only by accepting Jesus Christ, by having a time in your life where you have confessed your sins to him and asked him to be the savior of your soul. That's what James 1, 12 and 13 said. It said, not by blood, you can't be born into it, not by the will of flesh, not by you wanting it and trying to make it happen, not by the will of man. Somebody else can't get you saved, but by the will of of God. That's what James is saying in this verse. He says, of his own will begat he us, saved us by the word of truth, by Jesus Christ. This is the greatest gift God has ever given. This is the greatest gift that God is still giving to those that need it. It is regeneration. It is salvation. But to what end? 
To what purpose? Why did God save us? Well, James tells us in verse 18, of his own will begat he us with the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creation. It says that you and I have been saved so that we can be a first fruits. You know, this, this, this word first fruits has a, a couple of different meanings. Uh, but really, when someone uh, had livestock or, or had uh, made some money or had some type of possession, uh, the Bible speaks about the fact that the first fruits or the first portion of it, that it belongs to the Lord. First fruits uh, doesn't just mean that, but it, it is also uh, a testament of what is going to happen. Uh, when, I, when I see my brother uh, is, is really into gardening. Uh, he likes to grow tomatoes and, and peppers and, and all sorts of things like that. And he plants the seeds and eventually a, a, a little uh, green shoot, I guess it is, comes out of the ground. That's the first fruits. Uh, it is a testament of what is yet to come. It is a promise of what is on the way. That's what these first fruits are. And the truth is that when it says that you and I are first fruits of all creation, first fruits to God, that you and I fulfill both of those definitions. When it says in verse 18, of his own will begat he us with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures, uh, it is to be his possession and his treasure. That's what the Bible says. It says that if you're saved, you're his first fruits. You're his possession, that you are a treasure unto God. You know, the Bible speaks about this. Uh, go over to 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse number 9. God has saved us to be his first fruits, to be his possession a people that belong to him, to be his treasure. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, it says, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. Uh, maybe your Bible says a people set aside for possession. That's what that word peculiar means there, a possessed people, that ye should show forth the praise of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Christian, if you are saved, you are a treasure and a possession of God. You are his. You are his people, a chosen people, a chosen possession, a royal priesthood, a holy people is what you and I are called to be. We are his first fruits, but not just as his possession and as his treasure, but as we said earlier, as a testimony of his promise. Do you know that you were that Christian? That if you're saved, you are a testament, a testimony, a, a foreshadowing of God's promise of what he is going to do in this world. You are the first evidence, the first fruits of God's promise of what his plan is for all creation. You are a testimony of his promise. What is that promise? Acts 3.21. We'll look at a couple of verses that show this and we'll be done this morning. Acts 3.21. Speaking about Christ in Acts 3.21, it says, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. It says there is a time coming for the restitution of all things, the bringing back, the regeneration of all things. There is a time coming that has that purpose. Go to Romans chapter 8, verse 18. We begin to read more about this time. As scripture progresses, Romans chapter 8, verse number 18. Paul says, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope, because the creature itself also shall be delivered 
from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. It says that at some point, creation and its creatures will be delivered from the bondage that it is currently in, the bondage that you and I have already been delivered from because of salvation. Turn to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 10. This promise of regeneration, this promise of redemption is carried on through the New Testament. Ephesians chapter 1, uh, verse number 10. Ephesians 1, verse number 10. Uh, Paul writes, Writing to the church at Ephesus, he says that in the dispensation or in the segment, the section, that in the dispensation of the fullness of time, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. This is the promise that God has made to this world, that one day he has not only redeemed a people to himself, but he will redeem a world to himself, that old things are going to pass away, that the Lord will regenerate and redeem all of creation. This is the promise that he has given, and you and I are the testament of that fact. The fact that he has redeemed and regenerated you and me is evidence of the fact that he is one day going to complete that work in all of creation. Last place we'll go when we be finished. Revelation 21. Revelation chapter 21. Verse number one. Revelation 21, verse number one. It says, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, look, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. James says, Do not err. Do not make the mistake of thinking that God is the source of evil and sin in your life. Does God bring us through hard times to test us? Yes. And we've looked at that extensively through the book of James. But when we are confronted with a choice of sin, do not ever blame that on God. Do not make that mistake, for that is the farthest thing from God's nature that could ever be. God is not the author of sin. No, he is the author of all good in your life. Every good gift in your life comes from God. Every perfect gift in your life comes from God, and that's never going to change. There is no change in God's heart. There is no variableness. There is no shadow or shred of the fact that he's going to change and turn. You can be confident that we have a good God that gives unto us good things, starting with our salvation salvation, and that throughout all of history, he has been in the business of pouring out good into the hearts of his people. When Jesus Christ is going to the cross, when he is shedding his blood for you and for me, he is making all things new. He is making all things good through his promise. You and I are evidence and testimonies of the fact that God is doing this, will continue to do it, and will one day complete that work. Not only is he bringing good into this world, but the way in which he does it is always good. And so he calls and crowns you and I as his first fruits, as a treasure unto himself, and as a testament of what it is that he is doing and is going to do in this world. Do not err, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning, of his own will begat he us with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. With every head bowed and every eye closed, we come to our time of invitation.
those that are getting baptized, if they want to go ahead and make their way back now. The piano will play and begin to play in just a moment. Um, but with everybody with their heads down and with their eyes closed, nobody looking around, we have spoken a lot this morning about God's goodness. We have spoken about God's gifts, about what it is that he has given us and what it is that he feels towards us. That because he loves us, he sent his son to die on a cross for us so that we could be saved, so that we could have a relationship with him. Maybe this morning you say, I don't know if I'm saved. I, I, don't, I can't say that there's been a time in my life where I've asked Christ to save me. I, I, I can't say that there's been a time in my life where my sins have been washed away. Up to this point, I've been trusting in the fact that I go to church. I've been trusting the fact that I got baptized. I've been trusting the fact that my parents went to church, but it's never been a decision I've made. And I know that I need to ask Christ to save me. And so with nobody looking around, every head bowed, every eye closed, if you say, you know what, Pastor, that's me. I know that I need to be saved this morning. I spent my life running from God, but I'm ready to stop running. I'm ready to find rest in His salvation. If that's you, no one's looking around, all I'd ask you to do is just slip your hand up. If you're a man, we'll have a man speak with you. If you're a woman, we'll have a woman speak with you. Open up God's Word and show you how you can know for sure that you're going to heaven. Maybe this morning you say, you know, I, I haven't really viewed God as good. I, I've spent my life not recognizing God for who He is or not appreciating His goodness, not recognizing it, but taking it for granted. And I'm ready to stop doing that. I, I'm, I'm ready to start viewing God as the good God that he truly is. I'm ready to start praising God for his goodness, thanking him for his renewed mercies each and every day. I'm ready to, to, to just spend some time praising God every morning for what it is that he's done for me, for the great salvation it is that he's given me. I'm going to be quiet here in a moment and give you a chance to respond as you feel the Spirit leading you. Uh, maybe you'd like to spend some time down here at the altar or there in your seat just thanking God and praising Him for the good God that He has been. I'll be quiet. I'll give us time to, to pray. Uh, and then when we're done, our, our praise and worship team will lead us in, in a song. But take your time. They're waiting for everyone to be finished to spend time praying and spending time doing business with God, praising Him for the good one that He is.